Archbishop, um, very good to speak to you just in Christmas week. Also in one of the most turbulent periods many of us can remember in this long crisis of the pandemic. Indeed. What did you think when you saw the image from the Downing Street Garden? I thought that's going to be more work for the person doing the investigation. Um, I thought about the many people who will look at that and remember what they were doing on that day and the sorrow and sadness they felt on that day because of not being able to see someone or bereavement or the last time they saw someone they loved. I'm not quick to judge people. I want to wait for the outcome of the investigation. Part of this crisis is we need to support each other. And part of the difficulty of the crisis is isolation, isn't it? It's been the hardest bit. And people, from my work in the hospital over the last 18 months, 20 months, the fact of people dying alone, as it were, they don't die alone, they're always accompanied, but not by those closest to them. That sense of isolation is one we have to combat. And I think there's a natural human instinct which from time to time may go amiss of people who are working together saying, you know, just sitting down, having a glass of something and a chat, just to take the strain off of it. But these are the people who make the rules out. Absolutely. And that's why I'm waiting for the outcome of the report. I'm not going to personalise it. They were the people making the rules. They're also the people bearing the strain. And I think one of the things I've seen with, we're seeing this week in the cabinet yesterday, the enormous weight of responsibility. There's not one of those people at these places who don't know they're holding lives in their hands. People will understand that comment about them bearing the strain. Public office authority is a strain. It is nothing to those working in ICUs. You I know. have seen that personally. And I know, you know, I, I, I take your point about reserving judgment, but sometimes, surely, it's a matter of speaking out about what's right. What is right is that we keep the rules. I've, here this week, we've cancelled all social engagements. Uh, when people come down uh, for Christmas, uh, who were planning to stay with us, we've already lost one person um, who'd been invited um, because they tested positive. Easy to break that rule, but we'll keep it. There needs to be truth and integrity, and the cost of leadership is you set an example. People get it wrong. I don't want to live in a culture where people are just hammered when they make a justifiable error under pressure. This is about culture, though. But it's about, setting up. I agree it's, with you. It's culture and the moral authority to lead. I think that is exactly right. You lead from the front, which means you obey the rules. If so we, by that, it means this government, this prime minister hasn't. I'm waiting for the outcome of the report. I'm, as you know, in all these interviews, I'm really careful about personalising things because it's not, my, it's not for me to do that. But truth, integrity, moral leadership, heaven alone knows I get that wrong often enough. But I do know that it's essential. It's essential because in this circumstance, it costs lives not to have it. It costs lives not to have it. You're absolutely right. Um, and we've seen that. And as you say, I was, I've seen in critical care um, the cost. And the cost on NHS staff. The cost on shop workers. The cost on people emptying our bins. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a huge part of the population. The cost of, on people who were saying goodbye to people they loved. Um, but, so it really, really matters. Were you angry when you saw it? Was that one of your emotions? No, I wasn't angry. Um, as I said before, 
I just felt real disappointment and sadness. Is being vaccinated a moral issue? I'm going to step out on thin ice here and say, yes, I think it is. A lot of people won't like that. But I think it is because it's not about me and my rights. Now, obviously, there are some people who, for health reasons, can't be vaccinated. Different question. But it's not about me and my rights to choose. It's about how I love my neighbour. Vaccination reduces my chances, doesn't eliminate, but it reduces my chances of getting ill. And reducing my chances of getting ill reduces my chances of infecting others. It's very simple. So I would say yes, to love one another, as Jesus said, get vaccinated, get boosted. Is it a sin not to get it if you are in good health and there is no clear health reason not to have it? I practice sin well, but I'm not very good at judging it. Uh, sin or not, I would say, let's be positive, go and do it. But immoral then, not to have it when you are I in a good position I understand why people don't. I'm not going to get lured into this because I, I can see this coming <clears> back <throat> at me for, for years to come. But I would say, go and get boosted, get vaccinated. It's how we love our neighbour, loving our neighbour is what Jesus told us to do. It's Christmas. Do what he said. So you're not loving them if you don't do it? You can love them in lots of different ways, but one really practical way is getting vaccinated. What do you think of the anti-vax protesters? I'm, well, all of us know people who have very strong views about not getting vaccinated. And it's, I'm really puzzled by it. I don't understand it because it seems to me that the, I'm not a scientist. I do know some of the scientists who are doing this. They're not evil people, you know. This is not a conspiracy, goodness knows. I mean, I have enough trouble organizing a conspiracy in the Church of England. We don't even succeed then, <laughs> let alone a national conspiracy on vaccination. It's not a conspiracy, it's not a plot. They are not bad people. They are, in really difficult circumstances, giving us their best advice. What I think about them is trust them. They know what they're doing better than we do. They may be wrong, but they know what they're doing better than we do. Um, I must just ask you about the article that you wrote um, that was in the Sunday Times this week about the Middle East. Um, your joint article with the Archbishop of Jerusalem um, really decrying the persecution of Palestinian Christians by fringe radical groups. It seems to have caused considerable offence. The British Board of Deputies uh, of British Jews have called your piece deeply disturbing. The Israeli government, although not actually speaking specifically about you, has also called the analysis baseless distortion. Do you regret the piece? Absolutely not. Um, there's no criticism of Jewish people in it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's flagging up an issue that is taking place across the Holy Lands, uh, Israel and Palestine, the occupied territories, that whole patch. Is. But the Christian community has grown in Israel itself. There um, are one or two places where it's growing, but within the Holy Lands, and which are largely controlled to some degree by Israel, either within historic Israel um, or, or through um, uh, wars and conflicts, um, that within that area, since the end of the Ottoman Empire, just about 100 years ago, the population of Christians has gone from 10% to 2%. That is not growth. And we've seen it. I've sat with the people who are under pressure. And just picking up another point in the answer, we've, I've been supporting Christians under persecution around the world uh, for 40 years, from smuggling Bibles to Christians behind the Iron Curtain, through to visiting Pakistan and Sri Lanka and being with people at risk, and in 50, more than 50 visits in northern Nigeria. The state of Israel, as we say in the article, is a beacon of democracy and free speech and freedom of religion in the region. 
But that doesn't mean that everything there is perfect. We can't get into what so, if -ry. So you stand by, stand by the article, even though the Both of deputies... Us, I was in contact with Hassan yesterday. We absolutely stand by the article. Um, let's talk a bit about what happens very close to here, Archbishop, in Dover. Um, it's just nearly a month since around 27 people lost their lives mm. on a small boat coming from France. What did you make of how that was dealt with between Britain and France? Tragedy. Failure. Grief. These are people who, driven by the utmost desperation, set out in freezing seas and drowned. One can't begin to imagine their last moments. They included children. And for this to be dealt with by governments as though it were a sort of political football, part of our negotiation of our future relationship with Europe is a tragedy and it's a shame and we need the governments of Europe especially France and the UK but it's not only them because the problem is European wide in the in the geographical sense not the European Union sense we need them to get together and to put aside the political games and to say this is something that cannot be allowed. We need a, a policy that stops the push, long-term development. We need a policy that attacks the human traffickers, medium-term development, and we need a policy that keeps people safe traveling, short-term development. Uh, in the meantime, the government is pushing forward with its Nationality and Borders Bill, which could see the prosecution of those uh, entering the country unlawfully on these little boats. What I know, well, the bishops in the House of Lords have spoken very strongly against this and in public, um, especially Rose Hudson-Wilkin, who's Bishop of Dover, who, who is down here the whole time. I think when I look, contrast what that bill says with what the people of Kent are doing, Go down to Dover, Folkestone, right along those beaches. Talk to the RNLI folk. I, w I was out with them a couple of years back, and they were getting some boat people coming across. And I said, what do you feel about them? They said, well, they're just people in trouble, aren't they? We have more volunteers than you can imagine down there looking after these people. That's what this country is really like. They love people in trouble. They care for them. The Nationality Bill has got to say we are a hospitable, wonderful country. And yes, we need proper regulation of how this happens. But first of all, care for the desperate. And it's Christmas. That's what Christian faith says. The Bible says to us, protect the alien and the stranger. So the government is behaving in an unchristian way with this plan? The government has got this one wrong in moral terms. It can get it right, but it's got it wrong on this. Of course we need proper controls. Of course we need to go for the traffickers. Of course we need to stop the push factor. But the people who, in desperation, many Afghans are now coming through on these boats. There was a program promised last August when Kabul fell, 20,000 people over five years. When I last heard a few days ago, it hadn't even really started. Where's that urgency that got our heroic powers and our heroic RAF going into Kabul airport and getting people out? Where's that urgency gone? This is about dignity of human beings. So four months on, that the terms of that scheme have not been announced. Exactly. In the wake of what we witnessed in August. Yes. I mean, some look at this and say, of all the things that we've witnessed in the past 12 months, this was an utter moral dereliction of duty. It was a horrific 
thing to see. I can't begin to express my admiration for our servicemen and women who were on the ground. What that must have done to them, they are the most extraordinary people. The heroism of the pilots and the soldiers. But how did we get there? We've got many staff here at Canterbury who are ex-services, some of whom served two or three tours. They were, I won't use the words they used, but when I was listening to them, but they were devastated by what they saw then. How do we say to people, we spent 20 years and that was the outcome? We've got to do better now. We can make up for it in how we care for the refugees. Can I talk to you about one of the subjects that ITV News has spent a lot of time on this year, and that is the standard of social housing in this country. We've been utterly shocked Mm. to discover some of the conditions in which people are expected to live in this very rich country. What's been your response to some of the scenes that you've witnessed, that we've reported on? A tragic sense of familiarity um, from places I'd worked, from routine visits for funerals and stuff, of seeing that. This has been going on for 30 or 40 years. Um, I wrote about it about four years ago in a book I wrote called Reimagining Britain and then we set up a commission to look at it, a very broad-based commission, wide range of opinions and of faith and no faith. And they reported earlier this year in, in March in a report called Coming Home. And that, I, I know one of them, like your own team, um, who came from, who, who had never seen this really in quite such stark terms, spent a whole night weeping after one visit they'd done. And it is tragically familiar. Now that report sets out a whole approach to dealing with this. It challenges the Church of England to put some of its property forward for affordable housing. And uh, that is something we're committed to doing. And we're working on at this very moment. I was writing about it yesterday. And uh, it needs, it's not just a government issue. It needs housing associations. It needs government. It needs local government. It needs landowners. We need a revolution in social housing and affordable housing, both to buy and to rent and mixed ownership patterns. And we need to focus not on just the physical houses, but on how do we build community? Because the kind of things you are uncovering are tackled in good communities. That's what really matters. Do you have optimism that this government will act on it? Or it's not, you know, at council level, local authority level, private landlords, there's a web of responsibility here. There's I mean, a web. You, you've written about it a, a few years ago. We've just been reporting on it. What hope have you got that something might shift for the people who will be sitting in a flat watching this with a roof leaking on their head? If I'm really honest, it's a considerable uphill struggle. I know one or two people in government said, oh good, the church can take some of the burden. Cynicism. We've got to get over the cynicism. We need people who say in politics, my life's ambition is to deal with that. I want to be the person who goes down the history books as having made a difference on this in my local government or at national level. We need landlords who say, I'm not happy with building another estate of, or landowners, another estate of uh, unaffordable houses. It, your expression of web of responsibility is exactly right. We've all got to join in. But I come back to the fact we need to build communities not just houses. And that's what will change things most fundamentally. It's an uphill struggle. It will take time. We could do it in 10 years. 10 years is a long time if you've got it's, your children in a terrible tell me. flat. And that, that kind of, oh, acute situation, mould just right across the ceiling in a flat with people with a child in it. What that will do to that child's long-term health is terrifying. 
that can be dealt with in three months. But it takes money and it takes focus. A couple of questions for you. One of the sort of most memorable events this year was the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. Yes. Which you um, officiated at. What was it like? What's your strongest memory of that day? I think a lot of people was, is simply of the Queen sitting alone. Yes, I think that's got to be, that's the image that comes to mind. That's the image that comes to mind and in a very powerful way. But it was the austerity of the service, the simplicity. I remember going in and seeing the choir, not 30, 40 people, six individual singers, and hearing their voices lifting into the heights of that beautiful chapel in a way that turned your soul inside out. I remember the Queen by herself. I remember the moments of silence. The Dean of Windsor uh, and the way that St George's had organised that so beautifully with such passionate pastoral care. But for me, like so much that I see with Her Majesty, it's her personal example. I know that after the service, she was meant to go and rest. She's in her 90s. But she saw some distant cousins who'd come from a long way away. So before she went to rest, she insisted on going to talk to them to make them feel welcome. <laughs> this is a person whose whole life says, and it's such a message for us in this crisis, it's not about me. It's about others. It's obviously quite an emotional memory for you, Archbishop. Oh, yeah. It was a very emotional memory. It still is because I look at that and I think, what an extraordinary gift Her Majesty is to this country and to this world, particularly at times of crisis. The humour, the generosity, the unselfishness. And she's had to curtail her own wishes for Christmas. She's had to curtail her own wishes for Christmas and that she'll have just done it because it's the right thing to do. That's the example to follow. We should talk about Christmas. <laughs> well, we probably should <laughs> now. When's that then? <laughs> um, do you really want this beautiful cathedral packed to the rafters? on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day? Of course I want that. We will do what's safe. And at the moment, it's safe. We've actually... To not have just a packed this, cathedral? This cathedral and churches and cathedrals over the last 21 months, we have worked out how to do this safely. We've, had, we've got a really good record and we will go on with that record the first priority is the care of the people who come. But remember that it isn't just about, this isn't just theatre. This is about the worship of the living God who came as the most vulnerable of human beings, a baby in Jesus, to be with us in all the mess and to create a most extraordinary global community of over two billion people. When people come together at Christmas and when they worship and are led out from themselves, they find hope, they find stability, they find resilience. And if the, there's one thing we need more than anything in the years to come, it's resilience. Because this isn't going to be our last crisis. Until this vaccine, this vaccine is everywhere and the virus is defeated, we are going to go on facing crises. We need resilience and worship of God, putting ourselves in God's hands, in Jesus, who was right in the middle of it all. That will give strength and hope and resilience. So yes, I want people to worship God here. 
and for those with no faith? What hope do you offer those who are sitting, facing another Christmas full of anxiety, sickness, grief, who don't share your faith, Archbishop? What would you say to them in that moment? I would say two things. Oh, there are so many of us who, of all sorts, faiths, no faith, who can remember moments of the most profound isolation and grief. You're not alone. Even if it's just a phone call, reach out to someone. Don't bear it alone. It's unbearable alone. There's so many places now that people will be so pleased just to offer you a kind word and strength. And do it to someone else, because when we look away from ourselves, we are talking about the Queen and it's not about me, a great thing. When we reach out to other people, we get strength ourselves. That's, I would say, the miracle of God's work in people of all faiths and no faith. It's the generosity that brings us hope. And where you're grieving, I am so, so sorry and sad. Uh, I've been through that. It is such a hard road. But walk it with others. If it's getting too much for you, ring someone, ring Samaritans, get help. Don't attempt to carry the burdens alone. They are unbearable. Archbishop of Canterbury, thank you very much. Thank and you. And may we wish Julia. you a happy Christmas. And to you and to all the crew and to your family. Thank you.